Thank you very much. And of course, please keep your microphones muted unless you are given the um, chance to participate. And of course, you can engage with us through the chat. And please do introduce yourself in the chat. So we would like to meet you and learn more about you through the chat. Um, of course, I know that there are some connection issues sometimes um, in the internet connection, but it would be great if at various time you open your camera so you can we can feel a sense of uh, community presence. Of course, Sphere is very pleased to host this webinar because um, it, we're going to discuss some of the um, interesting and uh, very trendy um, topics such as um, the simulation and the tabletop exercises today. And of course, I'm very much, um, I'm, I'm thrilled actually to be joined by the sector experts who will introduce themselves shortly and also by the Sphere team who will be managing this webinar with us today. With that, I will hand over to William Anderson, the Sphere Executive Director, for a brief um, introduction. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Aya. It was great to see you again, and great to see Harris and Vlatko. I had the privilege of meeting in Sarajevo earlier this year and to meet um, new people, new faces as well. Thank you very much. You see, I'm the director of Sphere, and I just wanted to take a couple of moments, really just to um, either refresh or perhaps those who are new to Sphere, um, just a quick overview of who Sphere is. Well, since its, since its inception, Sphere has stood unwaveringly for quality and accountability in humanitarian assistance. It's been the standard bearer for human dignity, no matter the context. And through the humanitarian charter, Sets out, so it sets out a rights-based framework, which is and has been used by countless thousands of frontline technical policy and advocacy aid workers and other actors working in humanitarian assistance. So there are three foundation chapters of the Sphere Handbook, the Humanitarian Charter, which provides the foundation for principled humanitarian action. And these outline the right to life with dignity, the right to receive humanitarian assistance, and the right to protection and security. The second foundation chapter is the, is the protection principles. There are four of them. And these give the role of humanitarian actors to encourage authorities to fulfill their legal responsibilities for the welfare of people in their jurisdiction or state. And where they fail to do so, the role of humanitarians to assist people in need to stay safe, to access assistance, to recover from violence, and to claim their rights. And the third foundation chapter is the core humanitarian standard. And these provide nine commitments which organizations make and who are involved in disasters response to communities and people affected by crisis. Um, for example, it talks about the appropriateness of aid, the effectiveness of aid, the timeliness of aid, and gives the, the need for complaints mechanisms to be set up early on for participation and engagement. And then there are four technical chapters of the Sphere Handbook, water supply, sanitation and hygiene promotion, food security and nutrition, shelter and settlement, and health. Now, the handbook is available online. Um, you can go to the Sphere website, for example, or you can go to the Humanitarian Standards Partnership website. And there's also an interactive handbook, as well as being able to freely download the handbook. Sphere is a, is a small secretariat team based in Geneva, but with a wide network. So we have something like 70 focal points around the world, and we have more than 120 uh, registered trainers of Sphere. Now, going forwards, the next couple of years, we're going to be really focusing on training, on technology, and on quality. And I just wanted to outline the four objectives that we have for the next two years. So the first one is the Sphere Handbook, where we want to increase the awareness and effective use of the humanitarian charter and minimum standards. The second core stream is strategic partnerships. Sphere really wants to help align and promote cross-sectoral humanitarian minimum standards. The third one is about policy and advocacy, and we want to advocate for greater commitment 
to quality and accountability in humanitarian policy and practice. And the fourth area is the Champions Network, where we want to improve and support local ownership of humanitarian standards. Now, a key point I just want to make is that we talk about minimum standards, and this isn't minimum versus median or maximum standards. This is minimum standards for life with dignity. So I think this is a really important point about the quality of assistance. Sphere also hosts the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, and there are nine other standard setting initiatives. You can download um, whatever phone you have, you can download an app onto your phone um, and have the HSP app on your phone. You can quickly access these standard settings. So I just wanna take a moment to thank Felicity um, for giving me this, this time and to really uh, wish you all the best in this learning uh, webinar, sharing experiences and tabletop exercises. It's gonna be great, thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, I would like to give the floor also to the Sphere team for a quick introduction, and then I'll pass it through our experts. Over to you, Tristan, and then Felicity. Oh, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Very uh, good to be here and see so many people in the room. It's fantastic. We've got 71 participants. Um, I'm going to put some links into the uh, the chat, as you may have noticed already. So you've got a link to the Sphere website, the HSP website, the interactive handbook. And uh, if you go right to the homepage of the Sphere website right now, you'll see we're advertising a huge survey that we're running at the moment um, called How Do You Use the Sphere Handbook? That's now available in 11 different languages. So very likely, whatever language you speak, um, you can complete the survey in your language. Uh, please do that and please share that uh, with your, your partners and your colleagues because we have over a thousand responses already, but we want at least a thousand more and we're gonna get some really good data which we're gonna to use to guide our activities over the coming years. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see you today. Uh, my name is Felicity Fallon, and I am Learning and Events Manager at Sphere. Um, so that means my job is to support Sphere's trainers around the world. Um, as William said, uh, actually 140 listed Sphere trainers now. It's going up every day. Um, I support Sphere trainers. I help to develop Sphere training materials, um, which are all open access, free to use, available on the Sphere website. And I help to coordinate Sphere's training events. Um, Tristan and I are going to be in the background today. We will be in the chat um trying to answer any questions and post resources um so i will hand it back over to aya um who we must thank today for facilitating this event who will be introducing our speakers thank you thank you very much felicity over to you phil because you're on the first side on my screen so we would start with you phil for a quick introduction okay thank you aya uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this this event. Um, my name is Phil Crook. I am based in the UK. Uh, I spent 30 years in the UK Fire Service. I'm generally able to spend a large part of that with the UK's International Search and Rescue Team, which is the UK government's formal response to overseas disasters using the UK Fire Service. Um, I retired from that four years ago. Since then, I have been a, a teaching fellow or a university lecturer in crisis disaster management, exercise planning, humanitarian response, risk management with the University of Portsmouth um, and a, a couple of other universities in the UK. Um, during my time in the fire service, um, I was attached with the EU civil protection mechanism, um, obviously not, not anymore being from the UK, um, but also uh, work with the United Nations Simulation and Training Network. I'm uh, very pleased to be here today and I'm going to talk about um, uh, uh, an exercise and some of the approaches that we've taken um, with that event that we run. Thank you. Thank you, Pat uh, Thank you, Phil. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Patrick Trush. Um, like Phil, I'm also based in the UK. Uh, I'm also involved with the Simex series exercise. Uh, and I got involved with that uh, initially as a participant and then as a student and uh, now behind the scenes uh, developing uh, different ways of exercising. Uh, and I'll be talking a bit about those later. 
Uh, I'm also uh, involved with the simulation and training network, and I've presented some of this material at the humanitarian networks and partnerships weeks uh, in Geneva earlier this year. Um, and yes, my main interest uh, with this is through the CIMIC series uh, and working with the University of Portsmouth as a games-based learning researcher. Uh, my day job involves developing uh, training um, our technical training resources, and I also volunteer with the uh, Open Search and Rescue organization based in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Over to you, Haris. Hello, everyone. I'm Haris, and I am uh, uh, working as a migration coordinator at the Red Cross Society of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Also, I serve as a sphere focal point representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank to Vlatsko. Uh, thanks to DPPIC, uh, basically, I uh, start my sphere journey started. And also thanks a lot to Felicity uh, for uh, really uh, supporting me in the various initiatives regarding the sphere that we are implementing in Bosnia. Thank you. Welcome, Harris. Over to you, Vlatsko. Thank you, Aya. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, first of all, thank you to, to Sphere and to Aya for inviting us and recognizing the exercise that we had in October as a contributor to the uh, Sphere handbook and uh, the, the meaning of the, uh, of the handbook. Uh, as I said, my name is Vlad Kervanaski. I'm the head of Secretariat at Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Initiative uh, for Southeastern Europe. 19 years in this uh, sector, started as a military officer, then shifted towards the civil protection where I am uh, until uh, now. Uh, looking forward to the discussion and uh, the webinar uh, today. Thank you, Vladko. Well, I'll go for also a very quick introduction about me. Again, this is I again. I'm a sphere trainer since 2014, and I my sphere journey actually includes uh, managing and delivering sphere training, uh, sphere events, uh, con contributing to content development uh, such as uh, the sphere in urban uh, context training materials. Uh, providing coaching and mentoring. Beside that, I'm also a monitoring, evaluation, and accountability and learning consultant. And I provide services to organizations, UN agencies, donors across the world. And I'm very happy to be with, with you here today. Allow me to share my screen so we can start um, our um, presentation, the first one. Okay, so by the end of today, our objectives for today is basically to engage with the audience and explain the core elements of the simulation and the tabletop exercise, including scenario development, objectives, roles, facilitator guides, and the debriefings, and expose the participants to some of the example, the real world examples and the tested actually examples that we had uh, in the field with our experts today. And participants also will have the opportunity to ask questions and interact with us in the chat so they can uh, gain from the experience uh, through this webinar. Before we start, I just li would like to draw a little bit on the differences between the simulation and the TTX because we're going to discuss both of them in today's webinar. Um, basically, few differences. These are not all the differences, of course, but uh, these are the top um, kind of like obvious differences between both activities. Um, but of course, uh, if you have experience or if you are experts, you might identify different um, differences. Uh, so first of all, the nature of the activity in a simulation, of course, participants engage in a realistic scenario that mimics the real world conditions. This can involve the use of computer models, physical model or other tools to replicate a particular situation. And simulations often all, all aim for to provide hands on experience that closely resemble ac actual events. So it's kind of like trying to have um, a similar uh, scenario to the real world scenario that we experience. 
And whereas the tabletop exercise is more discussion based, where participants gather around like a table or in a virtual room where they can go through a hypothetical scenario and they can um, discuss uh, challenges, they can discuss some of the tasks that uh, have been assigned to them. And it focused basically, basically on decision making and um, rather than the hands on activities. In, term, in, ter in terms of uh, the level of realism, the simulation strives for higher level, of course, of realism. This may involve the use of advanced technology sometimes, computer models, and other tools to create an immersive experience, because the goal is that participants feel that they are dealing with a real-life challenge and situation. The tabletop exercises are generally less realistic in terms of immersion. They are more focused on testing the plans, the procedure, and decision-making processes rather than providing a realistic experience. In terms of participants' interaction, the simulation uh, often engage in a physical action or use equipment, resources, as, the, as they would in a real emergency, so they can interact in a more dynamic way. Whereas the TTX is primarily through discussion, so participants talk through a scenario, identify challenges, and then um, solutions, discuss solutions for a given scenario. In terms of use of technology, simulations frequently make use of technology, including the computer models, visual reality, or other tools to create realistic scenarios. And of course, the use of technology is more emphasis in the simulation, and it has to be planned way much in advance. And I think our speakers also will highlight that. Um, on the TTX, it typically rely on simpler tools, of course, such as maps, documents, and communication systems. And technology might be used to support the exercise as opposed to its to it being a core component of the exercise design. In terms of the focus and the objectives, the simulation often focus on testing specific skills, the equipment and the procedure in a realistic environment. They, um, they are particularly useful for hands-on training and skill development. The tabletop exercise focus more on testing and refining plans, policies, and coordination, of course, across the part, uh, across participants. They're also valuable for assessing decision-making processes and communication strategies. And of course, both the simulation and the tabletop exercise can be used by individuals or organizations to test their sk the skills, the processes, and decision-making practices. Um, now, a little bit on the why um, I would like to share with everyone here, just to have kind of like common understanding why we're talking about this topic now, um, why simulations and tabletop exercises are brought uh, into like uh, a kind of like international standards such as sphere. Because we all know that when you feel it, you are more more you have the the skills and the knowledge to be able to better be able equipped, and to better respond. Um, so here I'm I'm just I just want to highlight that the research show that people generally respond to an emergency the way that they are trained. So the more that you are trained in a simulated uh, environment, the better you are equipped to, to respond to the emergency. And also governments and organization must exercise their plan and uh, the procedures as they, they, are, they, they become better to respond and also to react. Um, what you see here in this diagram is that a typical steps for designing a simulation or a tabletop exercise. From now on, we're not going to differentiate between the tabletop exercise or the simulation because the general steps in terms of like preparation, engagement, the, the environment, it's kind of like the same, but of course with the differences that I explained earlier. So these are the general steps that uh, the process uh, go through. Of course, we would have we're going to talk about each step and there are multiple sub steps uh, that goes uh, under each of the steps that we're going to discuss today. So first of all, integrating a simulation based learning into your program begins with conceptualizing how this activity will meet the course, the teaching and the learning objectives, as well as considerations related to the time frame, the class size, your participants and also the instructions. What does that entail? That basically when you are setting the objectives of your exercise, 
emphasize that the exercise objectives and the specific goals participants should achieve by the end of the exercise. Have these objectives written, documented, and well communicated to the participants so they know what is um, the ultimate objective of the given exercise. Um, of course, and then the scenario development, of course, for any given tabletop exercise or um, a simulation, there should be a scenario presented and sort of like indirects and sort of like instruction and uh, more challenges in introduced as the exercise flow. So in terms of the scenario development, keep the scenario realistic and relevant to the participants' roles and responsibilities and to the overall objective of the exercise. Use credible and current information to create competing um, scenario. So you can utilize like recent emergencies as case studies. You can utilize, you can use realistic statistics and realistic numbers, of course, with the sources, keeping the sources um, for these uh, numbers. In terms of participant selection, study your audience and aim to select the participants at the same level because this might impact the outputs and the and the quality of the exercise. Of course, we all know that in, in a TTX or in a simulation, sometimes different departments contribute and different departments work within the same environment or coordinate within each other. So it, it might be challenging and difficult to have like participants at the same level. However, whenever you provide the in instructions, like the clarity of the instruction, the testing of, of the exercise can fill out some of these uh, gaps. Uh, moving to the uh, environment, creating an immersive environment. So simulation only work if participants buy into the premise, if participants understand their roles and why they are performing their roles and how their roles fit within the overall scenario. So the key challenge associated with building successful scenario or simulation is actually creating the learning environment that, faci that facilitates student investments in the experience. That entails actually the activity environment, basically depending, it depends actually on, on the simulation. Are you having the, your simulation or tabletop exercise in person? Are you having it in a virtual platform? So it really depends where do you identify the location or the platform that you're going to use for your simulation or for your uh, tabletop exercise. So you can specify also during building the activity environment, how participants will interact, how participants will engage, uh, with this environment and how they're going to engage within uh, within their groups. Uh, whenever you're setting the roles and responsibilities, ensure that participants understand their roles, responsibilities within the scenario and clarify how decision-making authorities and how interactions between the roles. Injects and events uh, are very, uh, of course, important throughout the simulation or the TTX flow, because it, when you introduce in the injects and the event at appropriate, in, at appropriate intervals, additional challenges, um, that would drive the scenario forward. Of course, time management, you have to be kind of like vigilant about time management, allocate specific time slot uh, depending on the different phases of the simulation or the TTX, including the scenario introduction, the discussion and the group work. We often hear actually that from any TTX or a simulation that, oh, we ran out of time, we ran out of time, time was not sufficient. That's a kind of, kind of like a continuous feedback that we are hearing so um, pay attention that you uh, the time is kind of like balanced between the tasks that are assigned to the group and the skills and the knowledge uh, within the group that uh, are participating in a simulation or a tabletop exercise. Um, integrating technology, of course, integrating technology refers to the strategic use of the online resources or other resources to enhance the simulation ability to meet the learning objectives. So we use technology, of course, to help make the simulation more realistic, uh, more interactive, and of course, help to overcome some of the constraints and the challenges. Some of the uh, specific steps might uh, include in incorporating serious games, that mainly means that you could collaborate with specialists to develop games with educational objectives that aligns with the objective of your um, simulation or scenario, allowing participants to learn and participate and practice their skills in the game environment. Um, we also have a radio communication simulation, the here where you kind of like create simulated um, radio communication protocols and procedures 
to involve uh, participants so they can use it for emergency response during, for example, military operation or, or during, for example, an emergency response. Especially these are uh, used for large scales and well-designed, well-financed, of course, uh, simulations. We have also drone operations. These are for the in-person um, the in-person uh, simulation where we integrate uh, drones to, into emergency response simulation. These can help for rapid assessment, situational awareness, or communication in crisis situation. So these are few examples, and maybe we can hear. We we would be happy to hear from your experience in the chat if you have experienced any other trending technology that, to be used. We would be happy to hear from you. So please don't hesitate to um, kind of like communicate that in the chat. Um, step four is talking actually about the simulation engagement where um, to facilitate active engagement and decision making among participants by fostering open communication and highlighting the key decision points. So discussion and analysis, mainly by encouraging an active discussion and analysis of the scenario. Of course, everyone at the beginning of a TTX or a scenario, there would be kind of like these moments of awkwardness, for example. People would like to understand, people would like others to start. So your role as a facilitator or as a scenario or as a, a kind of like simulation owner or facilitator to drive the discussion, to encourage the discussion and the analysis uh, between the participants, focus on critical um, discussion points, problem solving and coordination across different groups. Um, Decision-making, highlight key decision points with the scenario and ask participants to make decisions based on the information provided. And if you have, if you want to control and to tighten that decision, sorry, that decision-making, this should be clear in the instructions. So if the decision-making authority is basically limited to a certain group or certain individuals, this has to be well informed and well integrated in the instruction. Communication emphasis, effective communication and coordination among participants, especially in a crisis or emergency context. When we talk about the documentation, of course, encourage the participant to document their decision, their interaction, their observation, because this documentation will be valuable for the following debriefing phases. Now, the debrief, which is the fifth uh, step, at, at the debrief, this, this is, of course, a very critical reflection, which takes place after, of course, the simulation is completed. And this is a very critical step because it, it, at the debriefing, um, you provide the opportunity for participants to receive immediate feedback from the main facilitators and also maybe participants as peers, they can discuss together what they learned about um, the exercise. So the specific steps that we would like to present here today is debriefing preparation, allocate time at the end of the exercise for a debrief and initial debrief. This should include discussing key takeaways, lessons learned and areas of improvements. And also participants allow some time for a participant's feedback. Don't give only the facilitator's viewpoint, but listen also from the participant, how did they felt about engaging in that scenario. Participant feedback uh, mainly to share their experience during the exercise. Moving to the last step, which is evaluating um, the learning outcomes. And evaluation, of course, this is a, also an integral part of a simulation. And it's designed, of course, to identify its strengths, weaknesses, and measure whether the simulation succeeded in achieving the ultimate uh, goals or, or, or there are areas of improvements. And of course, the evaluation phase provides an opportunity for all, not only the facilitators, but also for the participants. Um, to, to, to understand if the goals are being met and if there are any areas for improvement for future iterations. Um, one of the um, specific steps is the wrap up, conclude the exercise by summarizing the main point, talking, th thanking, sorry, the participants for their involvement and highlighting the importance of continuous improvement and preparedness. And again, I would say always emphasize and link um, the objective of the uh, of the simulation with what was done during the simulation activity itself and ask the feedback of the participant if they felt uh, empowered and if they felt that um, they contributed to achieving the objective because the objective should be achieved from the participant, from the um, facilitators as well. 
these are kind of like the theoretical part of our webinar today. Um, before we proceed with um, examples for our experts, are there any critical questions or concerns? Please share them in the chat and we would be happy to answer them quickly. I see introductions, introductions, and I'm happy to see a very diverse community here. Okay. All right. Anyway, okay. Would you see evaluation as something for individual exercise? Um, for individual exercise. If I understood your question correctly, of course, the evaluation is... Um, a very integral part or for individual exercises. Can you clarify this question? Sorry, can you clarify this question further just to make sure that I answer, answer it correctly? Until you clarify the question, um, with that, I think I will hand over to Phil and Patrick. Our, Phil and Patrick, you are going okay. to start, right? Okay. Okay, so or, I'll or am I allowed to I'm sorry, am I allowed to ask the question like this or should I write it in the chat <laughs> to clarify? You can you can ask the question. Yes, we can. I, I was I was still muted, but now someone uh, unmuted okay. me. So thank you. Good, yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. I just so I understand maybe the background or the when we're talking about the theory part, sometimes the tabletop tabletop exercise is like a 45 minute exercise. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see these simulations as a four or five day simulation experience. So it was more of the question, especially when we're talking about evaluation and debriefing, do, would you see this like for a two hour um, exercise or a 45 minute exercise, just also important every exercise? Or are you talking more about, yeah, it's after a multi-day um, simulation, then you would do a, a debrief and an evaluation. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good question. Um, for a 45 minute uh, tabletop exercise, of course, the answer is kind of clear. Mainly your debriefing and the evaluation would come at the end of the exercise um, because the exercise length, as you explained, is not as days as it, it might happen in a simulation, which is field based. Um, for the simulation, I would also go, and of course the speakers can also reflect uh, from their experience, I would also go for a final evaluation. However, sometimes we go for sub-evaluations if, if things are not going on the right direction, if we are experiencing, for example, different challenges, or if we are seeing like uh, not the level of the participation or engagement uh, from the participants. So my, maybe we do some uh, sub reflections um, to enhance and to kind of like get back the direction of the simulation into the objectives. Because of course we would have an overall objective for a simulation, but we do have topics, we do have exercises, challenges for each day and for each exercise. So I would say that the overall evaluation until the end, because also evaluations means planning, resources and time also. And in a big simulation, um, you you wouldn't have like much uh, time and efforts always to reflect and to evaluate. So keeping keeping it uh, balanced, I would say, there's no like one rule to answer that. And of course the speakers can uh, reflect more on, on the answer. Thank you very much your question. Uh, others, if you have any questions, please um, type, it, type them in the chat and we will answer them swiftly. Over to you, Phil and Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Um, I will share screen. Okay. You should be looking. Okay, can I just check everyone's looking at a Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you. I a great introduction to what we're going to talk about today. Um, as you will have probably established, myself and Patrick will be doing a bit of a double act in regards to what we're going to be talking about. I'll talk about the um, the, the, the CIMEX series itself and how, and how Sphere is integrated into that process over the last few years. 
and Patrick will talk more specifically about certain aspects of the way we've developed new ways of working uh, because of the events of recent years and just because of a natural evolution of exercising theory. So um, what is the CIMEX series? Um, we have since 2012 been running a, a, a multi-agency exercise. Um, I'll talk a bit more specifically about the, the history in a minute, but it involves um, both practical exercises and notional exercises, both live field exercises and tabletop exercises, discussion exercises, and I'll explain some of that structure as we go through the, the rest of this, this presentation. Um, it operates um, physically in, in many different areas within the UK, usually within the county of Hampshire, which is on the south coast in the middle, um, but also online and also um, representations from other countries um, around the world quite commonly take place as well. We've put in place scenarios and injects to test all the things that you can see there, which are hopefully most of the aspects of some kind of emergency mobilization, whether it's a sudden onset emergency um, within a particular country, police, fire, ambulance, medical services, that sort of thing, or whether it's more of a longer term humanitarian exercise, um, CIMEX can do or uh, has done um, all of those aspects. As far as the history goes, uh, first exercise of 2012, um, it's based around the University of Portsmouth's Crisis and Disaster Management Master's course. So 2012 was a, a student-only exercise, a very small exercise based on humanitarian assessment, information management, um, and some of the concepts that organisations have to deal with when, when or if they, they mobilise to a humanitarian uh, emergency. Um, importantly, that year, it was what, we, what I would call an exercise-imposed objectives style approach. So we, we designed the exercise, we designed the objectives, and, and the students followed that structure, uh, the students being the participants. From 2013 to 2015, um, we started to add external participants and, and it wasn't all in one go, it grew uh, incrementally across those years uh, with emergency response, both in the UK and international. Again, standard sudden onset emergency responders such as search and rescue teams, medical teams, but also humanitarian responders, INGOs, in some cases, government organisations. Um, but the big difference for there was that we started to move to a participant-generated objectives approach in that there was much more interaction with those people taking part, those organisations taking part in the exercise to generate what they wanted for from the exercise, what they wanted to, to exercise, um, and also then to link those organisations together to test the multi-agency response objectives that you would get. 2016 to 2019 um, started to get extremely large. Certainly 2018 was the largest we had with just over 3,200 people um, on the ground, as well as probably another 800 or so around the world It involved over a three-day period. Um, still exercising to the same remit of those, those emergency response and humanitarian response and still working with that participated generated objectives approach. We did start in this period putting in notional, what, what I would call extended reality content. So not just virtual reality as it, as it was known then, but also um, tabletops associated with it, um, discussion exercises associated with it. And also towards the end of that, and this is where Sphere started to become involved, we started to combine educational input into the exercise so that certain members of organisations would just disappear during their exercise and they would be sat in a classroom speaking to some of the incredibly well-qualified um, trainers that Tristan and Felicity would send uh, and they would be given new input, in many cases um, content that they hadn't seen before, um, with which they would then leave the room and, and go back into the exercise and you could see the way that it changed their approach to certain injects, certain scenarios that they then came, came across. It's a nice tool as an exercise planner to have in, in, in your pocket because you can simulate other things while those people are um, in their input session. Uh, for example, they may have been kidnapped or they may have been lost in a building collapse. And both of those scenarios I have run at CIMEX with the remainder of their organisation, not knowing where they are, having to deal with whatever um, side effects have been generated by them having to be kidnapped or be in a in a 
a building collapse. And once those people have finished with their input, they come back out of that, they go back into the exercise and they feed into whatever elements or whatever little inject has been um, been put in place to, to cover their disappearance. Um, 2020, well, we all know what happened in 2020. Um, we did still run exercises, but it was purely online, purely discussion-based, lots of seminars, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, which ran. Um, uh, and I used the United Nations Simulations and Training Network as a, as a background for that to be able to include as many people as possible, but purely online. 21 to 23. 21 was still quite, um, or was still run primarily online. Uh, and again, using the, the um, HNPW as a background event to that, we ran a few symposia, which were part of the exercise uh, and, and caused those exercise breaks during that to allow the people attending the exercise to attend the symposia. Lots of great conversation during that period. Um, lots of uh, new ways of looking at some of the emerging technologies that came out of the, the pressures of the pandemic in 2020. But essentially, the exercises were smaller, still involved external participants. We are still covering the same sectors. Um, um, still had that combined input of exercise because um, Sphere run extremely um, effective online content as well as face to face. Um, but we were starting to increase the notional and that extended reality content. Uh, and, and they were attended both in person and remotely. Um, from 2024 onwards, uh, 2024 will be a, a slight change in that um, we have, as the world does at the moment, huge financial resource uh, and personnel pressures. Um, and some of the supporting mechanisms that um, we fund to make live, large live field exercises run are not available. We're still going to be running a, a CIMEX 24. It will still be um, obviously aimed primarily next year at the students of the University of Portsmouth on their crisis and disaster management course. Um, and there will be a small number of external organisations who will tag along um, and, and feed into the information management flow of that exercise. Just very quickly, I, I won't cover this in too much detail because, um, in fairness, I did a very good job of explaining that planning cycle. But the, the, the way that we work specifically with CIMEX is to have that concept, develop the, the simulation, um, which, as, as I said, involves from CIMEX point of view, a huge amount of interaction with the participants to make sure that they get what they want. And then also that um, that view of looking at how the agencies will work together to gain the, the huge advantages of having multi-agency exercises. Um, obviously, we're going to implement the situation. In however, that, um, that would take place as the exercise, and that can involve all those live field exercises, all the associated um, bolt-ons that we put onto that, taking, taking the form of various different injects as we go along the evaluation process we talked about and and, and to, to to just add a little bit to the question that was asked about evaluation uh, personally if you're not going to evaluate an exercise I, I don't believe there's very little point in doing the exercise uh, whatever size you do obviously some evaluations will be significantly more complex than others depending on the size and the complexity of the exercise itself um, but without evaluation um, as I say, not much point running the exercise um, mostly in any point at all. Out of that will become some recommendations. Um, and obviously, some people would refer to those as lessons identified. And then there's the integration process of taking those lessons and, and building them back into your organisations, back into uh, the policies, procedures, standard operating procedures that the organizations work and that closes the loop to, to start the process again to to you know, redesign a new concept and hopefully continue that development um, i've asked the question there where does sphere fit into this cycle at simex we've had them pretty much every element of that um, we certainly had them before situate simulations before exercises we've had them during exercises and we've identified gaps with organizations where we've said well you want to go to sphere because that's going to fill your gap so they've they've come in after the uh, the implementation or after the running of the exercise as well. Um, again, until twenty twenty, Simex, as I said, was large scale, largely field based. Um, as although I said, as I said, we were playing with the idea of notional content um, and and different ways of adding information and adding 
more complexity to the coordination and um, number of incidents that were being managed at the, at the scenario, at the incident. Following 2020, though, and some of the emerging technologies that came along in, in the form of online presence, we did start to look at many new ways of working. Um, one of those that we're going to talk about specifically was the use of gaming within uh, within an exercise environment. Now, this is something that's been around for a very long time, and I won't touch... I won't stand on Patrick's toes too much, but it's something that we've added in as one of those additional elements to the exercise. It doesn't take away from anything that's done on live scale. In fact, it only adds to it, adds to the information. But what I'll do now is pass over to Patrick, who'll uh, explain a bit more about how that happens, how that works. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, it's just been raised that there's been a bit of an issue with the screen sharing and a grey bar across the top. Would you mind stopping sharing the screen and trying restarting it i can do sorry i didn't know that's not happened here i'll stop and start again okay yeah that's a better that for me right? oh, yep, okay. thank you um yes yeah, so as, as Phil mentioned we um we even before the the pandemic in 2020 we did start looking at, at some other ways of engaging with students and and exercising um and when we're talking about uh i mentioned serious gaming earlier and we, we certainly started looking at that approach as well but maybe not in the the virtual or computer sense you might expect but also looking at serious board games um and looking at that kind of transition between board games and um tabletop exercises uh, this really kind of came to a head when we could no longer exercise in person and exploring other ways of uh, exercising. And I started looking more at the Matrix Wargaming format, which has been used as a, a discussion-based uh, form of exercising. Uh, however, I wasn't really sure going into it if something that had been developed with um, uh, antagonism between parties could still run and work as 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 a format in a, a humanitarian setting. Uh, so the initial play testing was really looking to see if the system would work at all. Uh, and for that, we did use uh, practitioners from the field uh, in appropriate roles to see if it ref would reflect what they they actually understand of their roles rather than um, uh, using students who, who weren't familiar with those roles. Uh, so that first happened as a, an entirely virtual exercise in 2020, um, and then was further adapted, um, continuing to run through uh, 2021, 22, and most recently in 2023. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, so the idea of this is, as I mentioned, it's a discussion-based exercise. Uh, but here we're looking at uh, providing players with an environment where they can really not only um, make decisions, but take ownership of them, where they're not only problem solving, but also having to identify the problems that they need to solve in the first place. Um, and by doing so, we're allowing the participants, the mostly students in this case, uh, to develop their own in-game narrative, uh, discuss, role play, and provide um, opportunities for exper experiential learning. Um, furthermore, we use a transparent adjudication system. So rather than uh, people just saying, this is what I want to do, and then being told they can't, uh, they can see you know, why are their, their choice is successful, uh, why are they not successful. Thank you. Um, and certainly here, Sphere is a recommended reading prior to the exercise. Um, however, one of the main goals here was really to encourage the participants to take ownership of their roles. Uh, so here they, they can do pretty much whatever they want and it's up, for the, up to the facilitator to make it work. Um, in this as well, we decided to use the same uh, disaster setting as the, the wider SIMX exercise. Uh, and it was important from my perspective to uh, ensure that we were using a natural disaster which did not have its own agency um, so that uh, there wasn't a player, for example, pretending to be an earthquake and deciding when aftershocks should happen. Um, as that sounded uh, 
more artificial and kind of would break immersion. Um, so we use the same fictional world as a wider uh, Cinex exercise. Um, and then that also allowed us to create consistency between the two elements. So they weren't standalone exercises, but the two kind of blended together and we could, uh, were working on how one can inform the other and change the setting when people move on from the tabletop exercise to the in-person exercise. It was also important uh, to uh, kind of getting back to the sphere, sphere standards um, to make sure that there was this element of empathy and understanding that uh, the people that you're working with are not a monolithic entity. Uh, so they had their own goals. Um, there, there were different facets for the, the fictional population, um, each with their own objectives, uh, separate from uh, being told this, this is the, the aid you will receive. Uh, so even without the, or even if all the international agencies coming in at the uh, beginning of the exercise, decided it wasn't safe to be there and took the next plane back, the exercise could still continue without them just using uh, local actors. Um, we also used mapping and symbology uh, that gave the idea of complexity, but was still easy enough for the facilitator to run. Uh, and also using symbology that people would be aware of uh, as it was um, created by, I think, the UN OCHA. Um, so these are kind of familiar, familiar symbols that people might actually encounter while, while working in the sector. Um, and finally, as I've kind of mentioned before, the, the role briefs were very limited. Uh, so giving them a, a kind of flavor text, uh, giving them some bits of information, but really encouraging uh, participants before the exercise to do research into those organizations, which may include uh, looking at sphere standards um, and, and other aspects to do their research, take ownership of their roles and decide how they want to portray themselves to other participants. Uh, next slide, please, Phil. Uh, so in the exercise, um, we kind of mentioned that sometimes it's, it's, it's quite short uh, for, for tabletop exercises. Uh, I think this one maybe kind of was on the longer side of short. Um, so instead of having uh, a 45 minute exercise, we had an exercise that lasted, I think, ranging from three to, to six hours uh, with approximately 40 students. Uh, taking up eight different roles. So across the top, you can see a range of uh, local actors where we see uh, um, groups doing the local uh, ministry for, for emergencies representing a, an equivalent to, to Lima, um, local population, um, different uh, interest groups, maybe a, a business interest group, and just something that you might normally call a, a militia. And then across the bottom, we have uh, an UNDAC team, uh, a voluntary search and rescue team, um, a newly created international non-governmental organization, uh, and then also refugees coming in from uh, a neighboring island. So all of these groups have their own little bit of flavor text, uh, but participants have to really decide, uh, do they want to portray themselves honestly? Do they want to compete for resources with each other? Do they choose to cooperate? Um, and they all have little different bits of the picture. So you can see through from this mapping, uh, different people, uh, different groups have different bits of information and they can choose whether or not to, to share that or uh, not to share that. Are they going to uh, ask each other for help or are they going to work by themselves? So that's really where the, the direction of the exercise. Uh, so next slide, please, Phil. Uh, Patrick, sorry to interrupt you, but we need to be quick a little bit. Okay. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, this is the kind of adjudication system, which also acts as a bit of a, a decision log, so you can track what's going on. And the icons are then added to the, this map so that you can uh, track how the uh, play progresses through the exercise. Uh, next slide, please, Phil. Um, and then after play, going back to that discussion bit, seeing if the, the objectives people set themselves really meant that they were successful or not, um, and really having that, that debrief element, um, which was very important in this uh, before moving on to the in-person uh, exercising. Next slide, please, please, Phil. Right. I was just gonna say, I found it really, really interesting because although we had lots of people talking to us, um, it was almost like 
um, they negotiated between themselves and made deals. And actually, it was only when they came back into the group and sort of were filling out the spreadsheet did we realize that actually, oh, they, they like all of their objectives really were to indirectly or directly help us survive. But we didn't actually know what they were doing to do that. So actually, a lot of the time, even though we were talking to people, we were the ones saying, can you help us? Like, have you have you got this water? Have you got this food? Have you and not really, you know, talking and trying to negotiate, but not really actually getting something tangible. And so in the end, that's why we were kind of like, right, we'll just do our own thing. Yeah. And that just didn't really work at all. So it was kind of almost like a bit of a, a bit of a fail because we weren't we weren't aware of like what situations were happening. So it did feel, I don't know, a part of it, I thought it might be because we were all online and it was, but also the other part, I just thought actually, no, because that's probably exactly what it is like in real life. Like the civilians are just kind of, they're there and they're sort of, do they wait for help? Do they do it themselves? Do they have to negotiate with people? It's just, it, for me, it was just so interesting and like, yeah, definitely eye opening. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah, that was taken from our first playthrough with students uh, done entirely virtually. Um, and just kind of raising that idea of uh, that kind of empathy and agency that um, through uh, these kind of uh, exercises, people can really f learn for themselves rather than being told, this is the way you behave. If, um, and kind of showing them, you know, why are sphere standards so important? So when they encounter these problems and then afterwards, we can also include that as part of the debrief saying, you know, this is, uh, this is a way of answering some of those questions that you came up with and some of the problems you yourselves identified. Um, and this is just a bit more feedback, um, really kind of raising that issue about, or that, that, that point about um, understanding things from other perspectives and kind of competing objectives. And I think, uh, I think we have one final slide. Yep, thank you. Sorry for the rushing through a bit at the end there, but uh, if anybody does want me to elaborate more, please, please do ask questions. Thank you very much, Phil and Patrick, for this interesting um, example. Um, let's open the floor for a few reflections, questions and answers. Please, uh, all the participants, feel free to type in your questions in the chat, and I'll facilitate those uh, with Phil and Patrick. Um, we already have a question from Rahman. We know that disaster in disaster response is always a multi-actor environment. How do we ensure that the CIMIX or TTX has all the key actors on board and we have specific roles for them? Also stressing that uh, how communities, CBOs, local organizations are involved and given the lead in such exercise. Um. Yeah, hi, Raman. I'll um, I'll come on on that one. I think this depends on how you approach the design phase of of your exercise. Um, I mentioned it quite briefly during the the, the, the history of the Simex series. In that, when we first started, it was what I would call exercise objective set. So the exercise designers set the objectives. If, if you're going to take that approach, and there's no problem with that, and in many cases, there's some big big advantages. Um, so the exercise designers set the objectives and then they will go and ask people or ask organizations to come along that they know would have those objectives in mind and then they take part in the exercise with a, a fairly rigid set of learning objectives um, and as i say it can be it, it's, it's quite simple to organize it can be cost savings there it's, it, there are some good advantages the way maybe to address some of the issues you bring up in your question is to take the other approach and to have the ob exercise objectives um, designed by the participants themselves. So that's a, it's a much more complex process because it, it requires asking who wants to come to an exercise. At that point, you might not even know what the main scenario is. Uh, and, and you can structure it at, at kind of any point along that, um, that, that spectrum of approach. But once you've got people who say, yes, we want to come to a, a humanitarian response exercise, the next question is, okay, what do you want to exercise? And you get the objectives from them. And then once you've done that, if you've got people involved with that and, and you gain that interaction and the investment in the exercise design from the participants, you end up creating a kind of a network which can then extend to, to other people, other organisations that might also benefit from being there, who can then also bring their own exercise objectives into the party. Um, 
and, and, and bringing them all together to design the, the overriding scenario, any any smaller scenarios within that, and then all the injects that would be put in to facilitate that scenario to achieve the learning objectives or the exercise objectives. Um, big advantage with that as well is as you're bringing in lots of different agencies, you can then also approach all the multi-agency exercise objectives that quite commonly individual organisations don't get the opportunity to exercise um, uh, and certainly don't have the um, the, the platform with able, able to, 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 to go that way and, and to look at all the different things that could be done that side of things. But I think ultimately it's about communication with, with your with your stakeholders. Thank you very Thank much. You. We have another question asking actually about what software did you use at what scale did the exercise, or is the question one? Yeah, what is the scale of the exercise where it was operated and where part of the horizon proposal looking at home at how might inform some of these discussions, uh, decisions, sorry, we'd love to discuss this more. So the software and um, the scale of the experience. Um, so yes, I mean, the, the, the software for the, the tabletop element, um, that really was, uh, the initial version was put together in a, in a matter of weeks. Um, so it was more the, uh, the narrative design that I, I really focused on. And so I used a uh, very, very simple systems that I was already familiar with. Uh, so we ran the exercise over zoom, um, and much of, uh, you could see there was a spreadsheet there, which was designed using. Um, Excel so that people could uh, over a shared spreadsheet so people could record their decisions. Uh, but there was also a voting element, which I didn't go into, um, and a random number generator used as well to add a bit of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, not quite sure if we're, they'd be successful in their, their, um, their, their actions or not, even if they convinced other players. So really, I think the, the point of this is that you you don't need, although you can use fancy technology and make things really immersive, you can do um, quite interesting things with with simple simple systems. Can I come in there as well? I, I, I'm just going to reinforce that last point firstly for Patrick. One of the things as an exercise objective, overriding objective we have is development of emerging technologies. And there are some really sophisticated pieces of uh, software applications out there that will run exercises for you. One of the things that sits behind Simex is, is the, the research that gets through the University of Portsmouth and other stakeholder universities that come along and participate as well. And we really wanted to make that available to everybody without too much of a learning curve in um, how that would be facilitated. So Patrick's um, detail there about using uh, not necessarily open source, but easily available uh, software is, is part of why we went that way. And I think... Um, I just saw that uh, Axel also added about um, Simexes are important, but just a tool. I completely agree with that. And I think it's absolutely vital that you you use every tool in your toolbox to develop your in, your organization and the individuals within the organization the best way you can. Um, sitting behind a computer is, is one aspect of that. Um, getting out in the field and doing it for real is another aspect for that. But you need to be prepared for, for, for one and, and and the toolbox you have is the way of doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. I think we have a following question, but this has been already answered. And we have another question, I think a final question before we move forward from Raman, um, who would like to answer the question about strengthening future preparedness and planning for organizations and stakeholders. Um, okay, yeah, I, I think I'll take that. I think, um, so I think the good thing about the games and the notion, other notional aspects that we add into it is that we can explore certain concepts without having to put on a huge live field exercise, but we can still build them into any live ex exercise elements that we're, we're taking part. So I think that reinforces, um, the the, the, the interagency working between organizations come to the to the exercise um as far as um how how it helped we, the evaluation process that we've used for the simic series exercises um whilst respecting individual organizations own 
um, privacy and confidentiality rules, um, we do ask those organisations to feed back into the CIMEX series for a, a wider report so that we can show how they have gone through that identification of lessons, done their own debriefs, feed those debriefs back into the wider exercise reporting process, and then show how those identified lessons have been integrated with into, the, into their organisations. Um, and on, on, a, on a number of occasions, we've been lucky enough to have the same organisation come for two or three years in a row to an exercise. And each year, we've been able to see not just an improvement in their general performance, their general response, but also specifically in the uh, areas that they've had exercise objectives previously and in designing the, the next level of exercise objectives for the next exercise, those scenarios or those injects have been just a bit more complex, a bit more challenging to continue to develop the individuals and the organisations that come to the exercises. Um, I hope that's answered that question. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, okay, we have more comments. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, uh, I think we need to move forward with the DPPI Flex uh, with Vladko and Haris. Over to you. I need Thank to. You, Raya. <clears throat> Just to share the screen with the presentation. I hope you see it. Can I uh, uh, see a confirmation that you see the slide? Yes. yes. Super, excellent. Uh, okay, so uh, DPPI Flex, uh, just for me to uh, to start uh, to give um, uh, an explanation what uh, DPPI is. Uh, as I said in my introductory words, I'm the head of secretariat of this initiative, uh, Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Initiative for Southeastern Europe which is actually combining 10 uh, nations, 10 national civil protection slash disaster management authorities in Southeastern Europe. Uh, you see the, uh, the flags, the national flags of the member states of uh, the initiative uh, on the logo of the exercise uh, with the aim to uh, design regional approaches in two areas, disaster prevention and disaster uh, preparedness through mainly uh, capacity building uh, uh, activities. And the focus um, of this year of uh, our organization through the annual training uh, program uh, was to organize um, a simulation uh, exercise, uh, a field uh, simulation uh, exercise. And uh, this was a, a challenge for us because uh, since the inception of the uh, organization 20 year, 23 years uh, ago, um, this is the first time that uh, DPPI as, a, as an initiative is organizing such an uh, uh, event of such a magnitude. Uh, there are trainings, we are organizing trainings, workshops, seminars, um, and small scale simulations, but uh, a simulation with 10 countries uh, using five different uh, languages, uh, it's uh, already a, a challenge for, for, for ourselves. Uh, so, uh, I will uh, just uh, explain how we came uh, to the to the idea of integrating sphere into the into the simulation uh, uh, exercise. Uh, it was a process that started uh, prior the, the the corona. Uh, I met Tristan at the humanitarian network network and partnership week in in, in Geneva in 2019, and then we started uh, discussing about the possibility for. Uh, collaboration between Sphere and, um, and DPPI. Uh, sometime in uh, 2019, uh, we, we uh, signed a joint uh, training of trainers uh, program, uh, which uh, was consisted uh, of three um, workshops uh, on basic level to be uh, organized and one uh, TOT. Then the, the corona came and we had to uh, shift and adjust a little bit the, the activities, but nevertheless, uh, we succeeded uh, with three workshops as uh, uh, online workshops as uh, organized uh, in 2020. Then uh, in, in support uh, from Red R UK, we had a TOT on online teaching um, uh, methods for the 
um, uh, nominated potential trainers. Uh, uh, and then uh, in 2022, uh, we had the proper uh, sphere train of trainers uh, held in, um, uh, in Tirana, Albania, where 15 uh, sphere trainers were, uh, were produced. We are extremely proud of this uh, uh, event because uh, not only the, the, the final event of the train of trainers, but also the uh, actual, uh, uh, the, the whole uh, package uh, was uh, kind of a unifying element between the civil protection agencies and, and, and Red Cross. And this might, uh, for, for, for me, was kind of a, a personal objective to start breaking the the silos is between the civil protection world, uh, national authorities, uh, civil protection, and uh, and the Red Cross. And through our trainings, uh, we kind of started breaking these um, silos uh, in, in, in our geographical uh, context. Quite an amazing group of people was uh, created. Again, uh, civil protection and, and, and Red Cross, and we showed that this is, this is functioning. Huh? In 2023, as part of the preparation process for the uh, exercise, we had uh, a sphere handbook in urban uh, settings uh, training again in, in, in Tirana. Uh, this was uh, facilitated by, by AYA. Uh, and again, uh, something new, uh, a training that was piloted by the German Red Cross. It was designed previously to be online, but we uh, move it one step forward and um, uh, organize it uh, with, a, with a physical presence again within the context of preparation for the simulation exercise. And finally, uh, in order to uh, strategically address our commitment, our joint commitment in the region towards the application of Sphere Handbook in the future, a uh, memorandum of understanding between DPPI and Sphere was uh, signed uh, in 2003 with a formalized, uh, you know, um, um, a model for uh, further collaboration in the years to come uh, in, in context of promoting uh, sphere. So this is creating a base, a, 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 a little bit of a, a background for the for the exercise. Uh, DPPI Flex 23 uh, was a full-scale simulation exercise happening from 23rd of October to 27th of October in Brčko district, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the aim was to test some of the capabilities de developed within our training program. Uh, Sphere um, application was one of them. Uh, the other two pillars of the exercise were uh, drone flying operations and logistics in uh, uh, emergency. So we try to, to, to match three components. Uh, all, of, all three of them can be a, a separate exercise uh, by, by themselves, but we try to, to match them into, into one, creating a little bit of a challenging environment for us as planners, but also for the, for the participants. This is just showing how the, the, the process of planning the exercise look like. As Phil mentioned, we started uh, in, uh, in January by uh, uh, composing a, a core planning team. Then we designed the, 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 the idea that we would like to have a, an exercise behind the flood scenario. And on the first planning conference, we invited the, the key stakeholders to try and uh, design the, the exercise uh, objectives in the three pillars, in sphere handbook, drone operations, logistic and emergencies. And we had a group on on Sphere Handbook, uh, which uh, 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 Harris uh, facilitated. And we started very, uh, you know, uh, in a brainstorming session, we, we, we had a wish list, okay, what we want to want to train. And we were quite uh, uh, ambitious because the idea was not to uh, 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 do something that has been done before. Uh, mainly when in civil protection, when you, call, when you mentioned a Sphere Handbook, uh, the, the first association is a, is a camp. Uh, they all want to build a camp. They want to, to, to establish uh, the tents and, and start running the, the, the camp. But the idea for us was actually what William said in the morning to um, uh, design uh, an, an exercise which will focus on the quality of the uh, assistance. So yes, the camp should be in place, but how do, to design an exercise which will uh, focus on the actual uh, quality of, uh, of assistance. So as we were planning the exercise, uh, uh, we, we had to shift a little bit and, 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 and decrease our, our expectations. And this is how we came 
uh, in September. Uh, um, uh, I mean, we had the trainings, we had the second planning conference, scenario development in September. We have a we had a tabletop exercise uh, on host nation support, triggering the international mechanism for uh, for sending assistance to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, finalize the planning uh, process. Uh, in October, we had the the execution. After the execution, we had the uh, debriefing uh, session, and now on 21st of uh, December, we will have the um, the, the lessons learned uh, workshop again in in in, um, in Sarajevo. Uh, this I will not uh, uh, spend much time. This is the exercise structure uh, for everybody of you who have been to exercises. I think it is a familiar structure, as I said. Uh, you have to have objectives, but as exercises are controlled experiments, you have to have a structure behind uh, this control uh, um, experiment to, to be driven into certain certain direction. Um, this is just saying the, uh, uh, how, how the exercise was running uh, through the days. So day zero, we had the request for international assistance. On the day one, we have the arrival of the European Civil Protection Team and the international teams. We had uh, all 10 countries coming to, to um, uh, the base of operation and uh, having the first meeting at the uh, at the OSOC. And during day two and day three, we had deployments and uh, actual activities at, in the field in three areas. Again, repeating drones, camp management, and logistics in emergencies. Uh, on day three, we had the observer uh, programs uh, program as well and the closing ceremony, and we finished the the exercise uh, on uh, day seven, day, day four, on 27th of October. Around uh, 200 uh, participants uh, overall, um, with uh, uh, I think 11 drones that were included, uh, and uh, the budget that we spent for the entire uh, uh, planning, uh, the trainings, and the execution of the exercise were, was around 190,000 uh, euros. So uh, one uh, also important aspects when you have a simulation exercise is uh, is budget, and, and you have to have uh, uh, this, this uh, well planned as well. Uh, I, I was uh, really running through the through the slides because uh, next uh, I'm handing over to to Harris, uh, who will who was the incident commander uh, on the camp management side, and he will take you over to uh, what was happening uh, on the side during the exercise regarding sphere. So Harris, over to you. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, thank you, Vlad. And hello, everyone. One more time. Uh... As uh, Vlad said, uh, I, I was during the DBPI flex exercise in Birchko. I have played the role of the incident commander for the camp management in accordance with the uh, sphere standards and would like to share with you some uh, five tips uh, that I think are very useful. As Vlad already explained, camp management in accordance with the sphere standards was one component tested by the DBPI uh, flex. Uh, sorry, I just uh, Vlad, if it's possible, back. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so it was uh, basically uh, one component that was tested uh, uh, within the uh, DPPI, DPPI flex exercise. So uh, DPPI uh, SE flex exercise uh, organized, uh, sorry, DPPI, DPPI SE first organized videos of the trainings, events, and meetings. Uh, regarding the sphere, and then uh, we decided to test the knowledge and skills of teams by this exercise. Uh, first tip would be uh, you have to learn how to use sphere handbook and uh, uh, in the practice, and uh, then test the sphere knowledge and skills in the practice. So uh, as you uh, saw in the previous slides, is basically uh, training that we definitely recommend to have in-person trainings. Sphere, uh, about the sphere handbook and also sphere in urban settings. And definitely a recommendation are uh, those online trainings that are available on the sphere website, such as how to use sphere handbook, how to be a sphere champion, sphere in practice, and also intro uh, introduction to minimal standards for camp management. Uh, next slide, please. Once you learn how to use sphere handbook, you can approach to preparation of the simulation exercise. Uh, based on our experience, our tip number two 
uh, would be you have to define clear and realistic objectives and expectations and prepare scenario of the simulation exercise. As what well, already mentioned in timeline of the DPPI flex exercise, there were series of activities and three planning conferences in the process of scenario development. So you have to invest time in the preparation of the simulation exercise. Uh, firstly, we realized that the simulation exercise for the sphere standards is not the typical simulation exercise of response to emergency and crisis. The focus of sphere exercise is more on decision-making process within the response. So simulation exercise is more about why and how we respond rather than end results of the response. Therefore, sphere simulation exercise on camp management is not about setting the tents, but it was much, much more about discussions uh, and decision-making process before setting those tents. Second thing it's, we want to emphasize is that uh, uh, we really realize that the incident commander is a key figure for the success of simulation exercise because incident commander navigates the exercise and setting the pace of the exercise. Incident commander has to be knowledgeable on the sphere standards and have to have clear objectives of the exercise always in mind. Incident commander is taking is uh, tasking teams and participants in the exercise. Therefore, uh, incident commander has to request from team that tasks are completed uh, through application of the sphere standards. When it comes to demographics, demographic of, of, ex, of affected population and explanation of their needs should be detailed as possible in scenario. Sphere is not only about Paris, I think we lost you. Okay, Harris, you're back. You were talking Great. about here is not about, only about. Yes, I'm back. Yes, we heard you until you so said. It was, uh, oh, it yes. was uh, only about, it, okay, 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 thank you. Uh, sphere is not on, only about the uh, technical chapter, Sphere is about also foundation chapters. So it is about uh, humanitarian ch charter protection principles and also uh, core humanitarian standards or CHS. So in other words, Sphere is about people and their dignity. Therefore, carefully uh, uh, preparation of the deep, detailed demographics in scenario is vital for the success of the exercise. Next slide, please. Uh, once you develop scenario and clear objectives of the exercise, the simulation exercise can start. In our case, we were playing a camp management simulation exercise for two days. As I already said, the incident commander is, set, is setting the pace of the exercise and navigating the exercise in direction of the exercise objective. Incident commander has to know uh, sphere standards well and uh, has to know how to use sphere handbook. Well, in order to task teams in a proper way. One more time, I would like to emphasize that incident commander is tasking teams and not leading teams. So teams itself have to, has to organize themselves and has to uh, uh, determine who is the team leader. As I already emphasized, field simulation is more on why and how we respond rather than on the results of the response. Therefore, the incident uh, commander can challenge any uh, I would say uh, any response decision, especially if decision is not in accordance with the, uh, uh, with the sphere standards. So as you can see in uh, our first day, uh, every, uh, every day start, is starting with a briefing uh, and it's basically familiar, to familiarize participants about scenario, demographics and what is the aim. And then incident commander is navigating team by tasking them. And you can see those tasks such as assess pot potential location, map available uh, capacities, project type of the assistance and calculate amount of the assistance, and also map of the camp. At the end of the day, you can, we have a debriefing and you can see uh, some of the photos on the right uh, side uh, from the exercise and how it was, how, how the first day looked like. So a lot of discussions, a lot of writing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the briefing of the second day, as incident commander, I formed, I formed a team that layout of the camp uh, plan was approved by the civil protection, and they started doing mapping and visualization of the camp 
as well as setting the tense. So you can see uh, you, on the on the, those photos uh, that basically the focus on the second day uh, uh, was on mapping and visualization. You can see especially the, the the picture on the bottom. So you can see how we basically visualized the areas that, where the services will be provided and also where the tents will be set. So uh, uh, you can always. Uh, uh, complicate uh, or uh, or put additional challenges to, to, to the team by uh, introducing the new arrivals of the population. We have new arrivals of the population, uh, uh, and the camp is overcrowded. And then you can task the team uh, to map uh, uh, camp in a, uh, and organize the camp and accommodation in in urban settings or basically uh, in some other field. Next slide, please. So. Fifth tip is about uh, observers to be informed about sphere focus exercise goals. Uh, if you are inviting, uh, if you are inviting uh, uh, observers and media uh, to the sphere exercise, you have to inform them about exercise goals in order to have realistic expectations. Whenever you uh, mention simulation exercise, the first picture in our mind could be a fully functional camp full of tents, many people, role players around, around. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So observers and media will make their expectations based on other uh, uh, experiences from the from the simulation exercises. On other hand, sphere focused exercise can be simulated without end results, such as setting the tents, uh, because sphere focused exercise is about why and how uh, we res uh, we responded. So you can exercise camp management in accordance with the sphere started by only mapping and visualization. As you as you saw on the photos, we were mapping and visualization, visual and we visualize visualized uh, the, the, the the areas, the service areas, and without setting the single tent. So it was basically in our in a, it was basically our case, and only five tents we set up. So a kind of three conclusions definitely this exercise was uh, was a great opportunity to strengthen uh, cooperation between the civil protection and the red cross in the region so it was really amazing uh, because we really had a mixed participants second uh, second conclusion could be that uh, dppi flex raised awareness or the sphere standards could be adopted by national uh, disaster managers authorities in the dppi SCE member states as kind of agreed starting point in minimum and the minimum to be achieved in response and the third kind of the lessons learned could be uh, that uh, this can uh, our experience can be disseminated as we are doing today at the webinar so thank you one more time and we are open for questions thank you Thank you very much, Vladko and Harris, for this interesting example. Uh, we do have one question, and then please, participants, if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to post it, post them in the chat. Um, a prior comment from Axel talking about and challenging us, actually, and challenging everyone here about that, uh, that most of the exercises are kind of like focused on agencies and operations rather than like a people following a people centered approach. So how, of course, this question is not only for you, but it's maybe for everyone here as a, as speakers. How do we ensure a people centered approach is integrated into our exercises? Um, I, again, if I can, I can start. I I, I briefly um, mentioned that that the uh, first planning conference we start quite an, uh, ambitiously when when sphere uh, is is in question. So uh, uh, how we wanted to uh, uh, move things was um, actually to what Harris mentioned uh, to plan design a camp, but after that to have a a time jump where we will have uh, uh, the camp populated uh, with a real person and then conduct an, an assessment of the quality of the uh, uh, assistance that they are receiving on a, on a camp uh, level. So that was our uh, our ambition, but uh, because of you know budget constraints and 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 how to plan everything, uh, we had to limit uh, our, our expectations uh, a, a little bit. 
um, what a sphere in urban context is is doing the training uh, this is also very uh, very important more and more of the emergencies will be coming uh, um, in, into an uh, urban context so understanding the the complexity behind the, the urban setting is very uh, important uh, and this is um, where uh, from an agency from civil protection agencies uh, uh, we need more um, uh, training and understanding about those com complexities how we can understand we need data we need demographics ex as Harris um, mentioned but also we need experienced role players uh, who will put some heat on the uh, on the uh, actual participants uh, to the to the exercise because we uh, as we said in the uh, in the beginning we fight the way we train if we if we train hard uh, then when the emergency will come uh, we will we will apply that uh, the, that training what we missed in in um, uh, in uh, dppi flex was uh, exactly this um, moment. Maybe uh, we could uh, have uh, include more experienced uh, role players, not, not as stati statisticians. Uh, you know, we have uh, volunteers from uh, Red Cross that were playing the, uh, the 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 victims and the affected population, but more uh, role players like experienced role player uh, as a I don't know a mayor. Uh, or a Red Cross uh, uh, secretary, or a UNICEF uh, representative, or a UNDP uh, head of office. Those uh, guys who are actually uh, present on the on the on the field when uh, emergencies are happening and that are supporting or complicating the uh, in certain cases uh, the, the 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 example. So the planning process is very important. This is why we invested. Uh, in three planning conferences that were taking uh, each of them for two days. We had a uh, couple of trainings uh, behind, and this is setting up the, the, the necessary structure for the exercise as a controlled experiment to, to, to run. Uh, will everything go uh, as, as scheduled? Uh, not. Uh, and this is not the idea uh, for the exercise to be the perfect exercise. Uh, to be honest, I, when we were designing it, I was hoping for many mistakes because you, this is how you you you, you learn, uh, and we did uh, intelligent uh, mistakes. And uh, with the evaluation report and with the uh, the, the uh, lessons learned workshop that we will have next week, I hope that we will have a good report that can be given to the governmental agencies for, for future years to uh, to come. Thank you very much, Vladko. Uh, if I may just jump in quickly. Uh, so do, there are two things. Uh, first of all, uh, in these simulation exercises, you need to have incident commander who will basically always uh, uh, ask uh, that those are the, uh, did agencies consult uh, uh, sphere standards in their response. So that is one, one way how we can have people-centered approach because we face situation where they are basically one team from the uh, from that, that took part uh, basically they came with a truck uh, full of the um, tents and everything and they immediately started to unpack you know to, to, to set the tents without any discussion consideration etc so that's where basically incident commander can set, set uh, can set a stop let's now discuss let's see uh, do we have a, uh, is that do we consider did we consider uh, what is the minimum to protect human dignity when we set the camp and then when we have when we uh, create or map the plan then we proceed so that's one thing and also role players are definitely something because uh, when you have uh, experienced role, role, role players then you can also have negotiation with those role, role players based uh, on their mandate and everything thank you okay that is oh, yeah, if i may step in as well i'll just um axel's point about maintaining that people-centered approach i think is, is really important and I think it starts at the design phase phase a lot of what Blacko talked about with those all those stakeholder meetings and the participant engagement before the exercise is, is even it sometimes even has a main scenario is absolutely vital because the individuals are part of the organizations that will come and the organizations should know their individuals as well but then again uh, uh, both the last both Harris and Blacko said about the, the role players it is absolutely vital that your players if they are in positions where they have to interact with the participants, really do know what they're talking about. Um, that's that's something that 
um, if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to maintain that that people centered approach because the individual person interacting with the role player is not going to get back a realistic response is not going to get back a response that makes sense to the way that they've been trained so the, the people you have working with you or for you at your exercise if you don't have them at, at a level of absolute expert you're not going to be giving value for money if you like or or added benefit to the organization and that's an area that um Certainly, the Simex series, and I suspect every exercise would wish to have the best possible. I mean, I look around the guest list, and I can see a couple of people that I, I've used um, very effectively in the Simex series, and I've seen operate at other exercises as well. That's that's absolutely vital to maintain that that people centered approach that Axel talks about. Thank you very much, Phil. Just one last um, reflection from my side before I proceed with my presentation as well. Definitely, Axel, the contribution that you're saying is vital and sometimes it's overlooked in an exercise. But I would like to emphasize how in practice we promote the people centered approach. Of course, of course, by engaging and prioritizing people's consultation at all the response stages, at the planning stages, during the implementation, and even during like the phasing out uh, of the response. But it's beyond that as well. It's not only community consultation. It's not only about needs assessment and understanding their needs. It's also by promoting like having accountability, knowing exactly how to co establish communication channels, appropriate communication channels with the affected population where we establish, for example, sometimes WhatsApp group to hear from them, where we establish sometimes community-based organizations that are, these community groups are formed from the affected population to monitor the intervention, to, uh, to share the feedback from the affected population to share some highlights to direct us how we are planning and how we are proceeding with our implementation so these are some of the kind of like practical um, uh, examples that we do when we do our implementation and then i think uh, we need to put more emphasis with, with when, well, whenever we're de designing uh, simulation or TTX and we want to, to have like sphere, a people-centered approach more emphasized to allocate and to think of how do we integrate these practices in the exercise more. Thank you very much. I'll press, yes, Vladko. But not, not only that, I, uh, I mean, again, uh, it's all about uh, setting up the objectives as, as Phil mentioned. Uh, if the objective is to uh, raise the capacity, send the awareness of the local population about Sphere Handbook, then you design your simulation differently. If you, uh, if the intention is to raise the capacities of the uh, national agencies, then uh, uh, you design it uh, in, a, in, a, in a different way. To be honest, uh, this is why I, I, I mentioned the level about the knowledge of um, the Sphere Handbook in our uh, geographical co uh, context, especially in the civil protection agencies, is not that that high. Also, from the other side, the, the level and interest uh, of the local population in peacetime uh, uh, context, it's not very enthusiastic towards exercises and simulations about something that might never happen. Huh? So this is why we chose an exercise which is focusing on raising awareness about the Sphere Handbook with, uh, uh, first and mostly uh, among the national civil protection authorities because often the cases and this the refugee crisis showed this uh, in 2015 and 16. Whenever this type of activities are, are, are happening, uh, camp management activities that are staying for for a longer time, they are usually outsourced to the to the Red Cross. Huh? The Seal Protection do, does does that. Okay, this is fear handbook. This is something that uh, Red Cross understands, and we 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 outsourced uh, uh, to them. So this is why we wanted uh, uh, to to have an exercise which will teach also the civil protection authorities how uh, to apply uh, sphere handbook. And this is why we started first with training. With training, we produce trainers which are part of their structures that can influence on policy level to include sphere handbook training. Uh, into their uh, national uh, 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 trainings. And then uh, we, we put the, the same people into an exercise uh, uh, context. Unfortunately, yes, uh, we, we didn't cover that much the aspect of the affected uh, 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 population, but that was not uh, uh, an objective for our uh, exercise. And if it is, then it, it will be a, a completely different uh, design. Huh? 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that would require additional like extended budget and extended resources and time, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Vladko. Um, I'll move forward with the final presentation for today. Um, so the final presentation for today is um, the tabletop exercise that we designed as part of the Sphere Standards in Urban Context uh, training package. Um, of course, just a, a very quick overview of that package. Of course, it's designed by the German Red Cross uh, with the Sphere, uh, with a range of uh, experts, consultants, and academic uh, consultants contributed to the development of this package. Um, of course, this package uh, starts with talking about um, the complexities of the urban uh, context, uh, but also it shows the opportunities that we as a humanitarian respondents, responders, how we can make use of the opportunities available to us in the urban context. And also we show and we discuss some of the tools and the approaches that we can utilize in an urban context uh, to assess the needs, to map uh, the stakeholders who's there and to conduct like a stakeholder analysis and to also analyze um, the needs building on operating in an urban context, such as the area-based assessment and other sort of assessments and profiling, for example. Um, the other components also, um, we introduced in the package uh, some of the um, analysis tools, such as the PESTEL tool, uh, and then participants got the experience of practicing the use of these tools. Um, also, where does a sphere standards uh, fit within this package? Of course, after like presenting and agreeing on the complexities, the opportunities and practicing some of the tools and the um, stakeholders mapping exercises in the in the uh, in the uh, course, uh, we introduce sphere standards and then we challenge the participants how they can adapt sphere indicators to fit within a given scenario. So participants would practice, of course, how sphere indicators can be adapted to, to a given um, um, context and to a given challenge. And we build the first uh, part of the, of the um, exercises uh, on the Ukrainian response because it's, it was one of the recent uh, responses that we are facing uh, across the world. And then the last part of the um, training material is the tabletop exercise which I will present to you now in terms of objectives and flow and how sphere is integrated. And I'll I'll touch base on how we integrated the people-centered approach into the exercise to some extent, of course. Now, the purpose of the TTX when we designed it is to give the participants the opportunity to implement some of the learning about system mapping, the urban context, and how do they adapt the sphere indicators in a simulated environment. Uh, while managing complex web of competing interests because we have multiple roles and multiple uh, stakeholders present in the scenario. Um, and of course, one thing I didn't mention that this scenario was designed uh, for both delivery, the online and the in-person. And we tested that uh, delivery in the online multiple times. And then we, we tested that in the in-person in Tirana, as Vladko was mentioning. Uh, participants' goal, when participants um, engage in the TTX, they had specific goals, mainly to identify, to identify the needs and opportunities in the urban population affected by the humanitarian crisis, and map and coordinate with other stakeholders, of course, and then implement and design projects to respond to the needs, but also, of course, use the sphere um, standards and adapt the sphere indicators. Um, and of course, the TTX provide a way to consolidate the learning and apply it in a simulated scenario that mimics some of the challenges and the complexity of a real, real world response. Some of the key facts about the TTX design, um, it was designed to have one up to three facilitators. And we always, um, we always advise that the more facilitators, the better the exercise is managed, either online or in person. Um, number of participants could range between 8 and 24. Beyond that, it become a little bit challenging uh, because you have to assign like specific roles, you have to manage expectations, and you have to manage the discussion between participants and between groups. 
um, can be done online or per in person, of course. Um, the minimum should run for two and a half hours. So when we designed that TTX, it was designed for two and a half hours. And when we tested that in the in-person, it took almost a full day to exercise because we allocated enough time. And I mentioned earlier that um, we always are challenged uh, in the time for group uh, inter interaction and group activities. So in the in-person, we allocated um, sufficient time for group exercise. And even we heard about lack of time and insufficient of time among the group. And the exercise is contingent to participants buy in. And of course, by buy in, we mean that participants' ability to be, uh, of course, um, creative and to engage and to use real, real life uh, uh, tools, such as using the humanitarian standard partnership, using the sphere standards and indicators, using the PESTEL approach that we introduced in the course to inform their action and to work with their uh, simulation. And this is one thing also uh, that we can um, promote the people-centered approach by also providing some guidelines to the groups. And with, when we are assigning their roles, uh, we can provide some instructions and some facts in the roles that would promote uh, community to speak up, community engagement more, and to empower the community and to give them more focus during the exercise. Here are the roles in the in the tabletop exercise that uh, was designed. So mainly we had four uh, groups. We had the community group where this is the community members uh, represented by the community members. We have the UN and donor network. We had the NGO network and we had the municipal government networks. And we had multiple participants, of course, within each network. And participants had only access to their own network. If they wanted to have access to another network, they had to request, it, uh, to request a meeting. And this has to go through the gameplay, through submitting an action, which I will explain later. In terms of the exercise landscape, we had one main briefing room. And of course, in the virtual platform, that's the one, the main call, the main room. We, we tested that through the Zoom platform. Uh, and we had four home rooms. These are the four uh, networks uh, that I explained. And we have other uh, four meeting rooms. So we had community centers that are that host meeting run by the community. We had the UN hub, which is meetings run by the UN. We had NGO hub uh, to host meetings run, run by the NGOs. And we had the city hall, which is which has meetings run by the city government. And for each of the meeting room, uh, participants had to uh, ask to meet and specify the objectives, why they need to meet, what they're going to discuss, and who they are going to meet. And each of the meeting rooms kind of like try to mimic what happens in a real scenario. Whenever we have an emergency, of course, we have meeting uh, head or led by the UN agencies to organize and sometimes to coordinate. We have some announcement from the government, how they're going to interfere, what resources are the, they're going to allocate. And we have, of course, the coordination among the NGOs. So we tried to provide all these platforms that mimic the real uh, life in the real life scenario in emergencies. And this photo is taken from the Tirana uh, training. This is one uh, example of a meeting. This is a meeting city hall. And this is a discussion between uh, participants who are uh, meeting to discuss uh, certain components. Now, in terms of the exercise flow, the exercise starts with a 30 minute instructions and debriefing. And again, I want to emphasize that instructions are very uh, important that everyone understands their role. And instructions always, it is advisable to share the instructions and even the roles and responsibilities with the participants ahead of time. If you are able be maybe a day before, so people are kind of like prepared, there's an enthusiasm across the, the, the participants, and they are also having some time to kind of like uh, brainstorm and discuss how they're going to uh, perform their roles within um, within the game. Of course, that's not always um, the case. Sometimes it's good to uh, kind of like surprise the participants with their roles and the challenges across the exercise. And then the exercise would run for five days, not of course actual five days, but five rounds. Each round is representing a day. Uh, and each round uh, has of course a debriefing and all networks briefing. 
So the exercise starts, as I said, with a 30 minute instruction and briefing, and, and then uh, groups would go for their rooms or for their tables to discuss a certain and a given scenario. And there's always a daily brief in the main room. So after going for a discussion for 15 minutes within their group, we break for a five minute uh, debrief. In that five minute debrief, of course, we give them more injects, we give more developing uh, uh, circumstances to the scenario. And then sometimes in that five minute debrief, we answer some of the questions and some of the requests that they raised uh, during the 15 minute, um, 15 minute work, work out within their uh, network and within their rooms. Um, so each uh, each round, each network can, of course, when 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 uh, the networks work within it within their group, they have to submit actions, and maximum they can submit uh, two actions. Sorry, at least. Um, whenever they they submit their actions, of course, the exercise control will monitor and approve these actions. And I'll show you how, how the approval process would work. And then the exercise control provide injects and daily brief in the five minute slots that I explained. What sort of actions participants have to submit? So we organize the actions into three categories. We have a mapping action and we have a coordinate action and we have an implement action. And of course, because of the response flow, the logic of, of uh, the response flow, the first thing is the mapping request that everyone would like to understand who is there, who is doing what, and what are the gaps. So they would submit a mapping action to describe what they would like to know about the urban context, about the scenario, the stakeholders, the complexities, the need, and describe the assets that they're going to mobilize to gain this information. So they would submit a map request. And then they would submit in the following rounds, they would submit a coordinate request describing their motivation to meet with members of another network and the duration of the meeting and where they would like that meeting to be happened because we have four meeting rooms. And then an implement action, that's when they decide what sort of intervention they're going to intervene, then they would describe the need that they have identified, and then the standards, the sphere standards that they are applying and how they uh, adapted the sphere indicators in that situation, and what they would like, how they would like to intervene. So they would submit an implement, um, implement request, asking, for example, for a budget, or asking for additional clarification, or asking for kind of like certain resources. Um, this is also an explanation how they can submit an action and how the actions are managed by the facilitation team. So um, the actions submitted, uh, if the action submitted is approved, so the box would go green. That means that their action is approved. This is the status. And then if uh, there is no sufficient details provided in their action that they submitted, the box would go yellow, asking them to provide additional details. And if the action is submitted is denied by the uh, exercise controller, the box would go red. And this is also one example from the Terana uh, training that we conducted. This is, this is showing how the uh, participants are submitting actions and then the status of each action. So we can see that the first two actions are approved, the third action is denied, and then the fourth action is approved. And this is one example of the UN and the donor network. This is how the game um, flow. And this is a, a very brief overview how the timeline goes uh, for that activity. So as I mentioned, it would go for a 30 minute debrief, explaining the rules, explaining um, how the exercise would flow. And then we would start with a formal a briefing to kickstart the exercise. And then they would have day one. And here in this exercise, we allocated for each day, 20 minutes. So it really depends on the time uh, allocated for the TTX, either virtual or in person. So you can stretch that time. The more that you stretch that time, the better, of course, based on our experience. So here we allowed for 20 minutes for each day, for each round, and then five minutes briefing, and then 20, uh, uh, 20 minutes for discussion and group work. And this is how the timeline flows. And then, of course, uh, we would have a final briefing and reflection uh, at the end of the exercise. And then we allocated some time for feedback. And we had also a survey to collect the feedback from the participants about the usefulness and what worked well and what can be improved.
And this is an example of the scenario. We provided, a, of course, a hypothetical scenario. And then the challenge was that the needs were different across different parts of the country and the population and the uh, the population and the circumstances of the population were also uh, different across different parts of the countries. Um, so this is the scenario. A few of the lessons learned that we discussed multiple times uh, from that uh, package and from the TTX. Uh, we realized that always having a sphere facilitator or assigning kind of like sphere ambassador or integrating within the gameplay, integrating someone who would always advocate for sphere and how... <clears throat> how to adapt sphere uh, indicators through the game, because sometimes people tend to focus on the planning or the responding to the needs other than like the actual use and the tailoring of the indicators. So, and that that's the main focus of the TTX actually is to challenge them how to adapt the sphere indicators in, in, in the given scenario and give a specific instructions to the community group. This is very much linked to the people-centered approach because after two pilots, we were hearing from the community group that we felt we are uh, left off. No one talked to us, uh, no one engaged with us, uh, no one prioritized us, but uh, after couple of rounds, uh, organizations started to come to us and ask us questions, questions, questions. So, of course, uh, of course, uh, resulting in, in an assessment fatigue for the participants, for the community group. So also, um, one thing that we discussed, how we can mitigate that and how we can promote and empower the community group more by providing them with um, kind of like supporting instructions, how they can react and how they can engage. And then also integrate within the exercise some of the instructions for the other group, how to prioritize a community group and how to apply in practice the people-centered approach to remind them. And for online delivery, it's recommended to use different platforms such as the Mural or some uh, Zoom features such as the Wello, if it's none, or any other, of course, features. There are many trending features nowadays. Um, this is in brief um, the uh, TTX that we designed uh, for the urban context. Now, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Felicity, can I ask you, because I saw that there are multiple questions in the chat, but not sure where to start off. Um, okay. Yeah, I can, let's, I can actually just see one question, uh, the last one. Mm -hmm. um, does Sphere or any trainer have any feedbacks, assessments, evaluation sessions on actual events from people who've done Sphere training or simulation exercises? Uh, it would be good to see how the exercises they had helped them or what are the shortcomings, difficulties in actual emergencies. I think we should have those feedbacks in order to incorporate them in future applications. Um, actual events here means after the actual emergency, not just in simulation environments or, or learning settings. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course, whenever there is any sphere event, and always Felicity and I coordinate, and of course, I'm sure that she coordinates with other sphere trainers. Whenever we have any sphere event, there's always a full package um, um, that is posted on the sphere website. It includes the uh, training materials. It includes the evaluation report and also the participants evaluation. And I would say that these are very important. And what you are referring to is how do we learn and how do we know what to change next? It's all embedded in the evaluation report and also in the participants feedback, because for every event we run a participant feedback. So I encourage you to go to the Sphere website and go for particular events and see the evaluations available there. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
we should we probably well we're coming to the end um just to uh, answer a bit more fully to that question about evaluations the training reports are always posted uh, onto the sphere website but it's true that we don't necessarily then go back to participants six months after the training or simulation or one year after the simulation or training to ask them how they've applied their learnings in real life um, so i think that you know although we're all very good at writing training reports straight afterwards we don't always necessarily go back a year later um, but i think you know we're all learning um in this this area which uh so that's that's something else for us to build in um to future trainings and simexes and um, one additional thing whenever we're having like a sphere training program ranging from like delivering a sphere basic training or multiple sphere basic training and then a tot there within the sphere training program because we are interacting with the same participants uh, normally we can observe and we can see how they like uh, interact with the sphere how they utilized and sphere and used sphere standards in their work sometimes as a trainer i receive emails from the participants how they used and how they integrated sphere standards in their work and i would be really happy and i always share that with the sphere team these are some of the kind of like the tangible things that we hear back from the participants. Okay, I think with that, this brings us uh, to the end of our event. I would like to thank everyone here, our uh, experts, uh, the Sphere team, of course, uh, and the participants for your engagement and your patience and your valuable questions. And we are always happy to hear from you um, I think Felicity and Tristan already shared the speaker's bio and our contact uh, details and emails. Please don't hesitate to reach out for opportunities for any questions or any support that we can uh, provide. Thank you very much, everyone. Felicity, do you have any other uh, points to raise? Um, no, just, just to say thank you very much to Aya for facilitating this event um, and to our speakers, Phil, Patrick, Harris and Vladko for very kindly sharing their time with us today. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, please fill in our little quick evaluation survey of this event um, and stay in touch with Sphere through our newsletter, through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through the website. Um, it's lovely to have you all here today, but let's make this the beginning of our journey together, not the end. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming, especially our speakers and facilitator. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You can activate your uh, microphones now just to say goodbye if you'd like to. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aya. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Ciao, so ciao. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.